So I actually was looking up yesterday a little about this, um, uh, the tale of the lizard uh, that we were learning about. And um, I actually found that it is a Mishnah. This is, uh, I believe it was Ezra's question, was the tail when it's shaking. So is that, is it metame? Does it give off, transmit tuma while it's still shaking? Or uh, uh, there must be some term where it's, uh, its nerves are still uh, moving, twitching. And, and, uh, and so it's actually a Mishnah in Tractate Alois. And uh, the Mishnah says, uh, let's see. The Mishnah here is in chapter one, Mishnah six. The Mishnah says here, a behema and a chaya are not metame, which means they don't give off the impurity called tumas nevela, adshatetse uh, nafsham, until their soul leaves. Now, the same law applies to shrutzim, that shrutzim are the creeping creatures. They also don't give off tuma impurity. They don't transmit impurity until teitzei nafshim, until their soul leaves. Putzu rashehem, it says, if their heads are chopped off, afal pishem farkasin, even though they are shaking and moving. Um, That's twitching. Twitching, okay, even though they're twitching. Uh, thank you. To Mayan, they are... Uh, one second. Hudzu Rashem, Afabisha Mafarkasin, to Mayan, they, they, uh, they are, they are able to transmit Tuma, even though their head is chopped off. And they're twitching. They are they are Tumayan. They are Tame, the Tumas Nevela for animals that die, and Tumas Shrutzim for the eight creeping creatures that we uh, studied about yesterday. They give off that Tuma, even though they are twitching. And he, what is the example the Mishnah gives? Kagoin Zanov Shel Lita'a. For example, the tail of a lizard, Shahima Farkeses that after it is cut off from the, from the actual um, body of the lizard, it, it twitches. And so we see that it still will be metame even while it is twitching. So this is the question that was asked yesterday. I think Ezra asked the question. And we have a Mishnah in Ahalois that actually says it clearly that the tail of the lizard while it is twitching it is metame, which teaches us that while it is twitching, it is no longer alive. The twitching is, uh, it really is, 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 is it, it's, it's really dead already. Now that is interesting what uh, Avraham told us yesterday, that uh, there was some scientific research done. I have no idea how they would have done this research, but some sounds like maybe it was done in some country where they behead people the and french revolution french the revolution. revolution and they had somehow made up with the guy they probably made some deal with him that after they chop off his head they'd like him to answer their question and they'll give him uh, maybe a good burial or something i don't know they must have promised him something and they said we're going to do this uh, scientific test so we're chopping off your head and afterwards, we're going to ask you your name, and you got to tell us your name while your head is separated from your body. And he supposedly said Jack. He they said his name. Him, they promised him a full pardon. <laughs> 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 Probably more like a, a burial with his body together in one piece. <laughs> you know, his body, uh, not one piece, but uh, in, in one grave. Uh, I don't know what they promised him. But anyway, they uh, and he actually said his name. That's a very interesting uh, scientific discovery. I, I don't know how to answer it. Um, I mean, we we you know the body twitching uh, sounds you know fine, but the uh, saying something, being able to verbalize something, that definitely sounds uh, quite surprising. 
raises our eyebrows. Yeah, the head rolled or not because of it didn't But you the see, they only took to the head. What are you saying? They should have asked a different part of the body to do something? Like yeah. move your leg? Shake your snap leg? Snap your fingers. Snap your fingers. <laughs> a lot of right. people can't do that when they're alive. Uh-huh. So anyway, I'm not sure how to explain that. But here it does seem very clear that Mepharkasin is considered the soul left, even though the body is twitching. Now, I did mention the all the the Rabbi. other side of the coin. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, that's right. You know, when the tail goes off, the, the animal is still alive. Right. right. The animal is not dead. Right. So I don't under, to me what you're saying and what you said in, in the statement before that appeared to be a contradictory. I could understand, you know, when you cut the head off because the head controls the rest of the body, that uh, then you can consider the body basically, for all intents and purposes, dead. In that situation, I can understand where, you know, the head would transmit uh, tuma, mm -hmm. even though it may still be twitching. Mm -hmm. But with the tail, the animal is still alive. It's gotten mm -hmm. away. I mean, that's that's its defense mechanism. So mm -hmm. it makes no sense to me that you would say that if if the tail is still twitching, the tail is tummy. Hmm. So you're wondering... The tail is not connected to the I'm neshama. Uh-huh. You're saying maybe it should be called Aver min hachai and not Aver min hames. And you want to know about the laws of it really should fall into a different category of Avram and Achai. Yeah. But now, the Mishnah. Limb, that limb is definitely mace. You touch the tail. The Mishnah could be talking about a case where the lizard was killed. That could be a case. I'm just saying, we could be talking about a case where the lizard was killed and it's considered Aver, um, Avram and Amace. But you're wondering uh, that, you know, it doesn't really. Um, you, you'd want, you're wondering what the laws are of Aver um, uh, well, I, I, I'm not, I'm not yeah. even I'm not involved in Aver Menachai. All I'm saying is that if the animal is still alive, and this is a defense mechanism, mm -hmm. okay. right? the tail is dead. I don't know. You don't know if the it, tail is dead. It's laying there. If it's still That's twitching, not. if it stops, if it stops twitching, I agree with you hundred percent. Okay, the rabbanon says even while it's twitching, it is considered dead, not the animal, but the tail is considered dead and is therefore matame. You're saying just like, you know, if somebody finds oh. the, uh, an arm of an individual and you touch the arm, then you're tame. Yes. So it seems that that there is tuma even if the animal is alive. Um, that's what it seems like here. It says, "Call aver mehen shepireish kibriyaso ibein menachai ben ames metame b'mago v'maso v'ayel." It sounds like it's metame even if it's considered an aver min hachai. Now let me just see if that if that. But the aver is dead. There's no question that the aver is dead. I mean, there is a question, maybe, but and Aver that's all he's being metame. If he packs One the head of the lizard, maybe he's not metame. But if he touches that tail, he is. No, but I think what the rabbi was reading, he was saying that irrespective of whether he's alive or dead, it transmits Tuma. Yeah, the thing but, is, it could be that that's talking about a, a, a person. I have to see what it says about an, an animal. Whether the animal is Matame but, or not, is alive or dead, the tail is Matame. That's what it sounds like. It definitely sounds that way from here. Um, I'm just, I just want to make sure that we're not talking about a human um, in, in the, when the rabbi are... talks about these laws, now the, the Mishnah is definitely talking about uh, an animal, so I'm about a, a tail of a of a lizard, and the Mishnah says it's tame. 
but it could be that it's talking about that the lizard was killed and the uh, the tail, you know, is still shaking. And you're wondering in a case where the animal is still alive, would that would that still apply? Um, but th didn't you say a little, you know, when you were reading the Mishnah, that the animal, as long as it was alive, would not transmit tumor. And right. now you're and now you're yeah. saying that it transmits tuma whether tail. it's alive or dead. The, the dead yeah. tail, the dead tail transmits tuma. Now, um, now you're asking what happens if the if the animal is still alive and the tail was dropped off, would that be considered uh, a dead tail or not? Because maybe you want to say that maybe our mission is specifically talking about if the lizard died. I, I hear you. Uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, uh, and uh, these are not laws that they commonly uh, learn, you know, the laws of Tum and Tahara. It's three, since 11 o'clock this morning. Um, but uh, I will, I'll try to look it up uh, and see, um, you know, how that works with the, uh, I'm, I'm sure, you know, we could probably find it in the, uh, in the um in the Rambam. Let me just look at the next Mishnah. Yeah, that's the Rambam. Yeah, I don't know where that is. But, but, but you're right, we, we look in the Rambam, you know, but the, the, gen, you can get a general picture. In fact, that's what our Gemara had said, that uh, um, the laws of, that it, uh, uh, there was a, uh, a, a Gemara that we uh, just learned, actually, and it said, study the Mishnah. When it comes to Nagayim and Ayalais, it says Ayalais, you could study the Mishnah, right? So the question on it is, study the Mishnah, Ayalais, why, why should you study the Mishnah? Uh, you're supposed to, they can't pass from a Mishnah. The answer is, yeah, go find the Gemara. There's no Gemara in all this. So from the uh, Mishnayas and all, it's basically uh, the, 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 the source material for the, for the Psach. For other uh, uh, tractates, you're right. You can't really pass from the Mishnah. You would, you would, your, your uh, base, your, your base would be Gemara and you, you know, develop, your uh, understanding based on the Gemara, but for Ahalai said actually it would be the Mishnayas because you don't really have another base. Now, of course, you could look it up in the Rambam and see how the Rambam Paskins, but definitely the Mishnayas would be a uh, um, a good place to to begin. Um, uh, Rabbi. Averman has shares with Tabi Mago, just one second. Yeah. Mm. Let's just take a look. Idiyas Mishnah Tractate Idiyas Perik Vav. I just want to look one thing up uh, based on um, what, which uh, as which one did you say? Tractate Idiyas yeah. Chapter Six, Mishnah okay. Two and Three. Let's see if it mentions the Ashrotzim. Um, Sepharia. Mishnah. Idiot. Track chapter six. Kazayas um, Busser, let's see if this Mishnah, it's a big Mishnah here. Um, He's talking about a person. Yeah. I'm just looking at the end. Maybe it, it jumps to animals, but I don't see that. Nope. Okay, it's not a good source. Rabbi. Yes, uh, Moshe. Yeah. Where there's decomposition, once the 
there's no nourishment going to that extremity. Mm -hmm. There's no longer life to it. There's got to be continuous um, nourishment going to that extremity in order for there not to be decomposition, which would cause it to be tuma. So in other words, a, a tail that's off is no longer being nourished by the body. It has nothing to do with the head. It's, it's being controlled by the head and in, in it's, in it's uh, those impulses that are going to that extremity. It, it's more concerned with the nourishment that's going to it. So you would... It, 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 it definitely no logically could be tame. We just want to make sure, double check that it says it clearly. Logically, right. We, we, we hear that, that logically uh, the lizard, it sounds that way from the Mishnah. The Mishnah doesn't spell it out clearly, but it does seem that the tail is tame. Uh, even in such a case, but it doesn't say it clearly. Could be that the the body was the, you know was chopped off and killed, and, um, and therefore. We but even if it wasn't, even if it, it wasn't, even if it wasn't, the tail does not nourish the rest of the body. That's what the we're body... saying. Even if it wasn't, do we have the clarity? Do we have a clear statement? You're you're talking logic. We want to know if it says it. I hear. We, we we also we agree with you logically. I'm just wondering if it if it says it clearly. That's all because Ezra wanted it. Um, I think in writing. Okay, so uh, good question, Ezra. We'll have to see if that uh, if that will be answered. Anyway, but we do have a little clarity on the the tail, even when it's twitching, it is considered matame. Um, and I did mention yesterday that there is discussion about an animal that is twitching after it's slaughtered about if a non-Jew is allowed to eat from it or if a Jew is allowed to eat from it. And do we say that there can't be something that for a non-Jew is prohibited and for a Jew would be permissible? In other words, there, there is a, a concept in Torah that uh, once something is slaughtered, it should be permissible to eat, even though it's still twitching. But there's also a a, 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 a a statement that a non-Jew would not be allowed to have it because for a non-Jew, there is no concept of slaughtering. And so for a non-Jew, that would be considered uh, taking meat from a live animal. So it sounds like twitching might be considered that it's live. So I'm throwing a um, opposite side of looking at it. and We have to sort of reconcile how to explain those laws. Why would a non-Jew not supposed to be eating from an animal that's still twitching if it's really dead. If the animal is really dead when it twitches, why would we say you shouldn't, you shouldn't eat from it? What would the reason be? Um, is, it, is it because it's still alive that would seem to contradict the statement over here? So it deserves a little more research to, to reconcile that, uh, that statement. But... Um, but at least regarding the laws of Tumah, we do have clarity. And that's what we wanted yesterday is regarding the laws of Tumah, we wanted clarity uh, about the tail of the, of the lizard. Now, um, let's go over what we uh, learned yesterday. So we spoke about the uh, different avoidas of this, the different services that were done with the sacrifices. And we mentioned that even though only it only says three things really in the Torah, but really there's a fourth. Uh, the first one it talks about in the Torah is slaughtering. The last one it talks about is sprinkling the blood, zrika. So there's shrita and zrika. And the middle one, it only says one word in the Torah, and that's vihikrivu, which literally means bring close. Um but the Gemara, our Gemara says, you know what that word means? It really means to receive the blood. And Rashi learned that the reason why we say that, that it means receive the blood in a vessel, is because it mentions it right after slaughtering. So the first thing you would do after slaughtering, and you need to sprinkle the blood later, is you got to receive the blood in a vessel, a container, to be able to hold the blood. So... Uh, even though it says vehikrivu, you should bring it close, it really means that you should do something that will allow you to bring it close. In other words, receive it in a vessel. That's how the, the, the Gemara understands it. And the, the, the reason why the Gemara is changing it from the simple meaning is because it says it right after slaughtering, and this would, this would, work, this would be the thing to do right after the slaughtering. Taishvis is not satisfied with that. 
correct. And Taisva says that the reason why we want to translate bringing close, the hikrivu, to mean receiving, why are we translating it differently than the literal meaning? The reason is because the bringing halacha is not a indispensable part of the service because theoretically you could slaughter right near the altar and you don't need to bring the blood to the altar. So when it says bring the blood to the altar, it really must mean something that's necessity, which would be receiving the blood. So Taisvis has his proof that it means receiving the blood. Rashi has his proof, and the Gemara just says it, that the that the, the Hikrivu refers to the receiving of the blood. Now you receive the blood, and then you sprinkle it. But what about if you're not near the altar? So the Gemara says that we, we now know three things that are written. Slaughtering, receiving the blood, doesn't say it exactly, but that's what it means, and sprinkling. But what about bringing? So the Gemara says, since it tells us to receive the blood, and it uses a term that means bringing, therefore we're going to say that that also is an integral um, uh, element of the, of the service. You could, it, it is dispensable, but if you do it, it's an integral part that needs to be done with the proper concentration and with all the laws and the bells and whistles that are necessary. So in other words, you could get away with without doing it, but if you do it, you got to do it right. And so ultimately we have the four parts of, serv of service when it comes to um the uh, when it comes to an offering, slaughtering, receiving the blood in a vessel, sp uh, bringing the blood to the altar, and then sprinkling it on the altar. Now uh, that was the uh, Gemara, and that, that that it was basically telling us that it doesn't say it clearly, uh, so it's not explicit. But Yesh Lahen Al Mashe Yismaichu, there is what to uh, base it on. And uh, that was the um, the concept of halacha to bring it. It does have what to base it on. And as the Gemara ends off, like safka mechlal kabala, don't remove it from the laws of receiving the blood. That it would fall into the same. It would fall into the same laws. It has the same rules. Once you do it, you got to do it right. And then the Gemara talked about the tahares, which we we spoke about. It means the mikvah. And uh, we we spoken uh, a lot yesterday about the mikvah, how a person has to be able to dunk in the mikvah, his whole body in one shot. And the Mish, the Gemara's uh, um, uh, tells us uh, that even though you may think that uh, as long as the mikvah has enough water for your body, that would be enough of a mikvah. That would be what one might think. The Gemara here tells us, no, it's not. We have to go by the average body. It has to be enough of a mikvah water, 40 saw of water for the typical person. What do you mean? I'm only, uh, you know, I'm a short guy. I could I could uh, uh, dunk in a much smaller mikvah. It says, it's called basarai, the Gemara darshan, the Gemara understands it to mean that the average person has to be able to fit his whole body in, in the mikvah. And if the average person wouldn't fit into the mikvah, even if you fit into it, it's not a kosher mikvah. And you would not be fulfilling the mitzvah of mikvah. So that would be the teaching of the Gemara that uh, it doesn't say it clearly in the Torah. It's not explicit, but it's yesh lohen al mashi yismaichu. There is what to base the this uh, law upon. And we spoke about uh, if possibly vessels might not need to be dunked in a uh, in a uh, mikvah uh, that is the full you know the full uh, forty saw There's discussion about that of course we follow we 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 uh, we do uh, you know we use a regular mikvah for the for vessels but um, but theoretically uh, there is a there is a different opinion there are different opinions uh, we did speak about a mayon a well that is not just a, uh, a cistern, but it's an actual uh, a wellspring that, or a spring that, that uh, uh, has, it's called Mayim Chayim or Mayon. And such a well would 
uh, uh, possibly doesn't need to have 40 saw because it falls into a different category than mikvah. The mikvah needs 40 saw. There is opinions that says that maybe the well wouldn't need 40 saw. Um, the uh, the Gemara, we also discussed about the three uh, amos that a mikvah, the, the measurement of the uh, Gemara, that it says it needs to be three amos, does that include the head or not? And we said there's two ways of it not including the head because a person's body might be three amos, but uh, when you get into the water, the water will cover the head because of the volume of the body that will push the, the water level above and it'll cover the entire head as well. So when it says in the Gemara, the body, per, a, a person's body is three amos, does that include the head or does that not include the head? And that is a discussion among the Rishonim, among the commentaries. And um, so it could be the, 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 the body volume will push the water above. It could also be that the person's head, you could lower your head so you don't necessarily need the um, you don't need water to be calculated for your head because your head you could actually bend and uh, you could bend it forward or uh, or so and therefore it would possibly be um, that the body is three amos and yet the gemara doesn't add anything for the head. Uh, the other way of learning is that the whole body is a three amos person's body is three amos. And that includes the head. And that would fit very well with the Gemara. But if you want to learn differently, then there were two ways of learning that the head's not included and it doesn't need to be included because you could either bend it over or the water the, the water uh, height, the water level would be uh, would go above it. We also said that this might be the source. I think. I'm sorry, what did you say? Because the water is rising. rising. Right, the water rises. Yes, thank you. So um, the other thing we said was this could be a source for the different opinions of how big an ama is. Because if you uh, uh, look around and say, well, the average person is uh, either, is, you know, if you want to follow the view that it uh, includes the head and it's three amas, then it would be surprising to say that the average person is 18, uh, 18 inches times three. That would be very surprising. But if you say the average person, uh, that, that uh, an ama is two feet, so you could say the average person is six feet. That would be much more reasonable or five and a half feet, five and three quarter, you know, 22 inches each, each, uh, each ama. That would be, that would make sense. So you could say each person is three amas. So this could be uh, connected to that, to that debate as to how big an ama is. So we, we spoke about that as well yesterday. We also spoke about the, um, the uh, gallows that um, Haman made for Mordechai, which was 50 amas high. And how they were hanged on the uh, on the gallows, the eleven uh, Haman and his ten sons, and there was three amas per person plus one ama empty space, and three amas on the bottom, and then an extra three amas to stick the gallows into the ground, and it actually altogether added up to fifty amas because if you each person is three amas, and uh, and then the the uh, extra ama above. Uh, and Tysus mentions that because they were dead, so their head fell forward, uh, and therefore they 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 could have been even if the head is not part of the three amos, but it would have been uh, would have still worked with the calculation because uh, because they were dead and therefore there was still a uh, they could be counted as three amos because the head would fall would would fall forward. Now the um, the Gemara afterwards mentions that the size. The measurement of a tumais is also not written explicitly in the Torah. It is uh, something that we have what to base it on, but it's not explicit. And um, and the Gemara says, "What do you mean? It's not explicit." So the Gemara explains that uh, when we talk about a sheretz, one of the eight shrotzim that the Torah specifies, a choyled ba'achbar tzav. Uh, it, the Torah goes through all of these eight shratzim, eight creeping creatures, and they all transmit tuma. The other creeping creatures do not transmit tuma. So if you kill an ant, that is not tame. But if you uh, have a rat, that would be tame. That would give off tuma impurity. And uh, of course, they, these laws don't really apply so much nowadays because 
we are all Tame, but in the time of the Beis HaMikdash, when they would have holy items, uh, Truma and Chala and so on, they, these laws would be very serious because they had to be sure to be, uh, to, to, to be pure and they would go to mikvah and so on and purify themselves from these type of impurities. Now, uh, so here the Gemara tells us that the laws of Tumais are not written explicitly. And the, the Gemara, of course, asked it is explicit. And the Gemara answered that there seems to be a contradiction in the wording. One place it says Bahem and the other place it says Mayhem. So it sounds, does it have to be complete, a complete a dead carcass of an animal, of a creature, creeping creature, or even a part of a carcass of a creeping creature. And the conclusion was that, well, how do you reconcile this contradiction? The answer is that there has to be some type, some size of a creeping creature, which would be like the entire, which would be like the entire thing. And that was, the Gemara's example was a chaymet, which is a snail. It starts out the size of a adasha, which is a lentil. So the lentil size of a lentil would be the size of even a part of one of these shrutzim that's dead. If you have a part the size of a lentil, that would give off impurity, um, even though it's not the entire creeping creature. What do you mean? How could it give off impurity? It says bohem, which implies that it has to be the entire thing. The answer is the size of a lentil is considered like an entire thing because that's how a snail starts out. That's the size a snail begins is the size of a lentil. And therefore, um, that would be enough. If it was smaller than a lentil, it would actually not be metame. But being a size, the size of a lentil, that would be enough to be metame because that's considered like an entire entity, uh, even though um, even though it's uh, it's very tiny and, and it's only a piece, but it could have been an entire entity of one of the Shemayna Shratzim. And that's a something that's not explicit in the Torah, but it is hinted to from the front. It is not more than hinted to, I should say. It's uh, it's uh, the Gemara understands it to be a teaching that is um, a necessary teaching, a uh, a teaching that Yesh Lehena Mash there is what to base it on. And, and uh, then we had the opinion of Rabbi Yesi Bar Yehuda that says that the minimum size is something that is a part of something, but it's like an entire entity that would be like the tail of the lizard. The tail of the lizard being that it looks like it has some life in it, that would be a, a small thing that's almost like an entire thing because it looks so alive that, uh, we, that the Torah is teaching us that that would be the size of something that's considered like, like, like whole, and anything that's that's that size or more would transmit tuma, according to Rabbi Yosi, Rabbi Yehuda. And and then the Gemara talked about the Arias. And the Arias, I gave you a sheet yesterday, but I realized there was a typo on the sheet, so I sent it out again today. So if you have the sheet, uh, you could pull it up. And uh, maybe we'll read this, we'll learn this Gemara again today. Gemara says, Arayus, it's the bottom line on page 11a. Arayus, uh, the laws of uh, sexual uh, relationships and, um, and uh, uh, literally uh, it would be um, uncovering erva, uncovering one's nakedness. So the laws of the Arayos, the Gemara says, they're pretty clear. What does the Mishnah mean that they are not explicit? Uh, they are Mishnah Ksivan. They are written explicitly. My answer is, it's not needed that the, to, to say that they're not explicit. Now we turn the page. Only for a person's daughter that is from someone who he raped, which means that a person's own daughter from marriage uh, would definitely be prohibited. It's clear in the Torah. A uh, person's daughter through rape, it's not clear in the Torah. Why isn't it clear in the Torah? Because if you look at the verses, and I wrote for you uh, the first verse and the second verse, the first verse talks about a person who one's, one is married to. Ervas Isha Uvita. 
in covering one's nakedness to one's wife and her daughter. And when it says her daughter, it could be it's not your daughter, it's only her daughter, or it could include your daughter and her daughter. But either way, you cannot reveal your nakedness, meaning that you're married to a woman, you can't have relations with her daughter. If she has a daughter from another marriage or she has a daughter from you, that would be her daughter is prohibited to you because that would be incest. As basmanov as basbita, you can't take her daughter's daughter, your wife's daughter's daughter, or bas bina her her. I'm sorry, as bas bina her son's daughter, you can't take, which means mean your granddaughter if she has a son, and you can't take her daughter's daughter, her granddaughter if it's from a daughter. You can't marry, so you can't marry her daughter, and you can't marry her granddaughter. Whether you, it's for you or for someone else. Rabbi, from different man. Yes, Moshe. If there is, let's say there's a, con, let's say that uh, it's a, uh, a, a non Jew who converts, her, those kids from that previous, from that marriage before the conversion took place, that means right. that they're, that's a different situation that applies differently, though, doesn't it? Once uh, the person. It, there might be rabbinic laws about it, but yeah, the biblically, uh, you know, they're not called your daughters or her daughters. Well, when did they become her daughter? Before you got married or after? He's saying if they're not converted, they're goyim, and then they convert later. So they're, they're con converts. They're not considered. And then uh, what? Related. The children are from whom? Her children from before you got married are never us, sir. It's if you had the child, if she came... To the marriage. Anyway, it's it's children. it's not applicable. Let's let's not mix in case of convert. Right. Convert here. Well, let's talk about the simple. Keep it simple. And so we're talking about a person who's married to a woman and she has a daughter, whether it's with you or whether it's with a different husband. That is clearly written in the Torah. Bita says can't marry her daughter. Clearly written. It also mentions the granddaughter. Now the next verse talks about someone who. You raped. Ervas bas bincha. The nakedness of the daughter of your son. So you raped a woman or didn't marry her. If you, you know, don't have to necessarily be a case of rape, but it's someone who you're not married to, but you had a son with her, and that son has a daughter. So your granddaughter, are you allowed to marry the granddaughter? of a woman that you raped? The answer is no, you can't marry. What about your daughter's daughter from a woman that you raped? So you can't marry your granddaughter from a woman you raped. What about a daughter from a woman you raped or just had relations with and didn't marry? Would you be allowed to marry your daughter from her? It doesn't say it. Isn't that surprising? It doesn't mention daughter. It mentions granddaughter, but it does not mention daughter. So the earlier verse that talks about marriage, it does mention daughter. This verse does not mention daughter. So the Gemara says, not explicit. It doesn't say it clearly. We just figured out what the Mishnah is talking about. The Mishnah is talking about a case where a person had relations with a woman without being married, and the daughter is in question. We don't know. Are you allowed to marry the daughter or not? Now, you might tell me, well, what do you mean? If you can't marry the granddaughter, isn't that a kal v'chaymer, an a priori argument not to marry the daughter? Wouldn't that be a kal v'chaymer? And the answer is, not really. We uh, have a teaching that you can't come up with a negative commandment from a, you can't make a kal v'chaymer. Ain you don't make an azhara, a negative commandment, from a um, from a and um, and we learn that actually from the law of not marrying one sister because it spells it out. You can't marry your father's daughter. You can't marry your mother's daughter, which means your sister, and it um, it basically teaches us uh, that and you can't marry your sister from both. 
Why does it have to tell you you can't marry your sister from both? Because isn't that obvious? If you can't marry your father's daughter, you can't marry your mother's daughter. Obviously, if it's your father and mother's daughter, you wouldn't be allowed to marry her. And the, the Gemara learns there, and it's a Gemara that talks about it, mentions that you can't marry your sister from, from, from uh, that it, it teaches us that you can't make a, a priori argument to prohibit something, and therefore it has to spell it out. And ain masirin minadin. So uh, here it doesn't spell it out about a daughter, uh, a person's daughter that they have through uh, wedlock. They would not be allowed to marry, but it doesn't say it. So it's not explicit. So the Mishnah tells us the laws of Arayos are not explicit. There is what to base it on. It's prohibited, but it doesn't say it explicitly. What is the what is it based on? The answer is it's called a Gzeira Shava. A Gzeira Shava means you find a word in one place and a word in another place. And the fact that it says a word in one place and a word in the other place teaches that the laws that it says here apply there. And so the law that it talks about not marrying your daughter from your wife would apply to not marrying your daughter from the woman you either raped or had relations with without being married. So the same law of daughter would apply here because it says the same word. Does anyone know what word we're gonna we're gonna be uh, using to that, that it says in both verses? What what word is the same? Hen, hen. So the word is hena. Hena. It's the hena. Hen, hen. So, Hena. So, the word is Hena. Now, um, so the Gemara says, um, that we're on the top line of 11, 11b, top line. So, Levitai Mayanu Sasai, we're talking about someone's daughter from a woman that he raped. The like Siva, that it doesn't say it clearly, it doesn't say it explicitly. The Amar Rava, Rava says, Amar Li Rab Yitzchak Barab Dimi. Yitzchak Barab Dimi says, Asya Hena Hena. We make a gzeira shava. We make a uh, a teaching, a way of deriving the laws from something called the gzeira shava. It says the word twice. Uh, what's the word? Hena, hena. It says in this verse, hena, and it says in a different verse, hena. And so we learn one to the other. That just like in the other, it says uh, the daughter, and here also it would prohibit the daughter. So it's not an it's not learned from an a priori argument. It's learned from a teaching that was given to us by tradition that the fact that it says these two words in two places, we, we learn one from the other. And we also learn that the punishment would be the same punishment. And where do we learn the punishment from? Asya, zima, zima. It doesn't say clearly what the punishment is when you when a person were to marry a daughter. And But we learn from the fact that it says zima regarding having relations with one's mother-in-law um, that the prohibition would be uh, would be reifa, a certain punishment called, uh, which is uh, considered burning. It doesn't mean that you get thrown into a fire, but it's called burning. And it's, um, they would throw hot, melted um, lead, lead, lead or uh, tin uh, in, in one's, down one's throat. And, um, and that was the, the, uh, the punishment of reifa. So that punishment, it says regarding having relations with one's or marrying one's mother-in-law. So that law of Srefa, it says Zima, and it says Zima by the law of not marrying your wife's daughter. So we know that the punishment is Srefa. But what do you mean? What about if a person has a daughter through wedlock? Would that also be Srefa? It doesn't say Zima in that verse. It says Zima only in the verse that talks about having relations with one's daughter through marriage, through one's wife. What about having relations with one's daughter out of wedlock with, with the woman that you're not married to? Uh, that daughter doesn't say the word Zima. So how would we know that the punishment is Shrefa over there? Anyone? Yes, uh, Ben. No, I have a I have a question about the previous one with Haina Haina. Okay. Shoot. Because Haina Haina in Hebrew, yeah. I hope you hear me. Yeah. 
Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. I have a question on the previous one with the word Heina Heina. Because Heina Heina is only in Hebrew, it's only for females, not for males. In English, when they say they, they mean both. Mm. So, so when you say it in English, it doesn't really count. Um, they means both. Zachar uh -huh. and Nekeva in English. So, but my question then is, what about a woman having relations with the son and father? Is that uh, part of the same thing? A woman having relations with her son. Not her son, just anybody's father and son with, with, two, with two men, which are father and son. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Like here, it sounds like a man cannot have relations with any woman and her daughter, or any daughter with her mother. It, it tells you both ways. But what about so if, the other way about a woman? Right. Is so is that if allowed it, for a woman to have relations with so a man, the son and father? So it would be definitely prohibited because uh, the, the man, it, it, it says it prohibiting the man, but the woman would be prohibited because the man can't do it. In other words, the son, let's say the son. So he wants to have relations yeah. with his father's wife, right? Right. So that would be prohibited. He, now, he, now you want to know if, if they're not married. Oh, one second. No, no. And not if they're not married he, to the... Not he, so, uh, the rabbi. Right, he, it's the same woman. One woman. She has relations. Right, with, right. Yeah. What their Lisa ben, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the the uh, the laws. Um, just one second. Um, but it's not mentioned here in the Gemara. Yeah, but right, it's not applicable here. That's the thing. But the word henna over here applies to a It doesn't apply to a woman or a daughter or anything like that. It's it's actually um, you are forbidden. You are forbidden. But is a woman forbidden to have relations with, with two men, which are father and son? So the answer is no. Uh, if um, um, the, the answer is no, because the, the laws that apply to the man apply to the, the woman as well. So just like the man can't do it. In other words, the son would not be allowed to marry his father's wife. So when he's having relations with his father's wife, she's part of that sin. I'm so you're asking, can she marry the son? Wife. I'm just saying a woman. No, not a, not a wife, just a, just a woman but that wants to have relations with, with two men, which happen to be a father and son. There's no marriage involved. And no rape, right. but here we talk about rape or marriage with the women. I, th I think we all understand that relations ap apply when a husband and wife are married. So if she marries... Yeah, but that's not reality. I'm not talking about reality. You know, Torah law sometimes does not involve reality. I mean, the Gemara also talks about um, possible cases that many times may not occur, but they but they are cases that they talk about for you to learn things from it. So back in those days, I don't think a woman could marry a father divorce him and then marry a son one second there is actually a mishnah i'm sorry there's a mishnah that says if they're not married 
that the, the Mishnah says in Yevamas, Noisei Adam Anusas Aviv, Umafutas Aviv. Um, that the Tanakama says, it's an argument in the Mishnah, that the Tanakama says a person could marry the woman who his father raped or the woman who his father seduced, the, um, the woman who his son raped or the woman who his son seduced. Rabbi Yehuda Oyser, Rabbi Yehuda prohibits the, the, the woman who your father raped and the woman who your father seduced, Rabbi Yehuda uh, prohibits. So this would be the answer to your yes. question then. Seduced right? is an the argument. one I'm talking about. What, the, what is that? Which, the seduced is the part I'm talking about, okay. not the married so, part. So either one, it's the same. They argue both cases, whether it's right. Yeah, yeah. And where was this? Right. It's, it's a Mishnah right. in uh, Yavamais, chapter uh, 11. And does it appear anywhere else? Uh, that I don't know. But I'm sure the Rambam talks about it. What's, what does the Rambam say? Um, and let me see. Um, because I thought I... I see what the Rambam it says. Was, it appeared somewhere else as well. Uh -huh, maybe. Um, one second, let me see if it brings up here. So it is a discussion. Anyway, it's not really applicable. I'm I'm happy to answer your find the find yeah, some yeah, questions. I'm, not really I'm, uh, exactly what we're talking. I'm about. glad that, is, that, but, that it is for, forbidden. Well, it, it's a machlokes. Yeah, you'll be. Uh, it's a machlokes. But uh, let's see what the halach is. One second. Um, uh, I have to look up that. I have to. I don't have that gemara in front of me to see what the uh, to see the source in the Rambam. Um, Where are you? Uh, here, here, here it is. Here it is. One second. I, know I found it. Friend. I found it. No, I didn't. Hilchas Yisurei Bia, Chapter 2, Halacha Yud Gimel. So let's see if it's there. Hilchas Yisurei Bia, Chapter 2, Halacha 13. Im Anas Aviv Ay Banai, Ay Achiv, Ay Achi Aviv, Isha, Ay Pita, Isa Hare Zumu Teres Loi. If a person raped or seduced a woman, if a person's father or son or brother or uncle raped or seduced a woman, Hare Zumu Teres Loi, Vyisa Ena. This woman is permitted to him and he can marry her. Because it doesn't say, it only says HS, or it's only prohibited if it's the wife. So the Rambam says that it is permitted for both the man and the woman to get because married. I know of a case. Ah, now we get the whole story. Like that, oh. <laughs> that somebody, told, somebody uh -huh. told me about it. Uh -huh. That's why I asked about it. So someone had relations and then the son married the, the, the girl? No, the son went out with a girl and after a while she changed her mind and started going out with the father. With the father? She liked the father better. Yeah. That's a crazy story. Wow. Anyway. And he was married at that time and then he had to get divorced and the whole story, yeah. Oh boy. Anyway, we should never know of such stories. Okay. So Rabbi, the bottom Rabbi, yes, yes, before Moshe. you go 
I just want to mention, you know, the story of Lot, eldest daughter gets Lot drunk and has sex with him without his knowledge. These two, the, the two daughters, I mean, wasn't this also a, a, an incident that plays a role in what we're discussing? Um, I mean, he's having relations with his daughter, which is obviously they prohibited. They had relations with him. He was drunk. He was, he was drunk. drunk. They got, you know, there's a fear that there would not be any further descendants. Uh, uh, in, in, the thing the is, that they were afraid that the whole world was destroyed. So they thought that this was their, you know, humanity is going to be, it's almost like Cain in marrying his sister and Abel marrying his sister because that's how the world was, was going to, you know, was going to move forward. So there seemed to have been some, a little leeway. They thought that the world, they thought that they saw the whole world being destroyed. Uh, the, the, uh, the sulfur and the, the, the smoke and the, you know, they thought everything was, uh, was over. They're the only last people on the planet. They thought they're doing the mitzvah, like to keep the uh, humanity going. So, so it's a descendants of like the them. Moabites. The, 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 no, Moab, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Moab. That was one of the, one of the, from Noah, yeah. Okay, so, um, so, no, what, wait, by Noah's, Noah's family had children. Noah, you know what I mean? In other words, Noah's, um, they, they, Noah had children, Noah, and they were married. So they didn't have to marry sisters. They were all married in the, in the, in the ark. So Noah's children didn't have to commit, um, you know, incest to have, to keep the world around. When they left the ark, they had kids. They were married. So you didn't have incest over there, but with Cain and Abel, it was it was like it was similar. It was sort of incest, but it was permissible. It was because to keep the world, the world, uh, you know, that was how the the world needed to uh, to exist. Okay, let's try. Let's finish up again. We're just uh, doing finishing the re review over here. So uh, we learned from Zima Zima, and I asked a question, and we got a little sidetracked over here. Uh, but the question was, it says Zima Zima. And the question was, it says Zima, when it talks about uh, the punishment for marrying a woman and then um, being with her mother. So that would be having relations with one's mother-in-law. And there's a, there's a, um, a punishment of, um, of, of, of Srefa, the, the death penalty. The question was, what about having relations with one's daughter through rape or through uh, 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 through uh, out of wedlock, so would that be prohibited uh, with the punishment of sreifa? We just said it's prohibited because we learned a gzera shava heina heina. It says heina both places. How do we know the punishment is the the burning punishment? Sreifa. So it says sreifa when it says it talks about it says the word zima. So where does it say zima when it talks about having relations with one's daughter through marriage that means he married a woman and he had a daughter or, or he married a woman and the woman has a daughter there's a punishment of Srefa. but what about connecting that law to having relations with a daughter not through marriage but through wedlock what about there is there Srefa? so the answer is you use the heina heina Shava that we already said earlier and then you say well if that case has the punishment of Srefa, you could now learn it to this case. So what we're really doing is going around in a circle because we're saying, number one, it's prohibited from Hena Hena. And number two, it's going to get the penalty of Srefa because the earlier case doesn't say Srefa there, but we learn it from the mother-in-law law. That mother-in-law having relations with the mother-in-law is Srefa. So that teaches us having relations with the daughter through marriage is Srefa. And then we do Hena Hena again and say, well, if that case, Zima Zima taught us Srefa, now Hena Hena will teach us to connect the Srefa that it says there to this case of Srefa. So we basically have two Gezeira Shabbos, two words that it says in two places. One word was Hena and Hena. The other word was Zima and Zima. And based on these two words, we're able to connect the laws in these three situations. One law taught us the prohibition. Another law taught us the punishment. And that is what it doesn't say clearly, but it is, it doesn't say it explicitly, 
but yesh lahen al mashe yismaychu, there is what to rely on. Again, we're, we're using that term to refer to a gzera shavah. And then the final piece of Gemara was hein hein, uh, hein, hein gufei taira. These final laws are called fundamentals. They're called major, uh, these are the ones that it doesn't say explicitly, but they have real support. So the Gemara asks, what about the other ones that it's only a hint? Are they not called gufei taira? Hani in Hanoch, the earlier ones that, uh, that, uh, that, that are more hints, are those not considered uh, gufe taira, major parts of taira? They, so um, they are not fundamentals of taira. So the Gemara answers that no, they're really both. Elaema hain vihain. You have to add the letter vav. This and though, these and those are both gufe taira. They are fundamentals of taira. Hadran Allah hakol chayovin. May uh, we return to you. Hakol Chayavin. Okay, so Met Hashem tomorrow, hopefully, we'll uh, begin the next chapter of Ein 